Thank you for wanting to hear about what virtual respect is. Uh, I'm calling it kind of like designing respect inside of virtual reality. So as said, I'm Michelle Cortese. I'm a design lead on Facebook's AR VR experiences team. That's actually essentially just Oculus. So if you're familiar with Oculus, I'm from Oculus. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm here to talk to you about how VR creators can kind of change their strategy to bake respect and consent and empowerment directly into virtual spaces. So the best way we can do that, and I'm gonna have to go really fast, so apologies if I talk fast, there's just like a lot of content to cover, but I'm gonna start with uh, establishing what social VR actually is. Uh, we'll talk about harassment in social VR and what that looks like. Uh, then how embodiment actually amplifies harassment, and then I will introduce the concept of virtual respect and then offer some solutions that if you were to be a VR creator, how could you actually apply those? So first, um, what is social virtual reality? Uh, essentially, it's just massive multiplayer online games that people enter in VR. Um, so here is myself and my teammate Andrea inside of our team social VR app. It's called Facebook Spaces. You've maybe heard of it. Uh, and actually, show of hands, who's heard of it? That's good-ish. Um, so our team at, at Facebook, which is, again, essentially Oculus, works on not just that, but um, building virtual places for people to socialize inside of VR. Um, so, because most of you are not familiar with Facebook Spaces, here's a bunch of it. Here's a bunch of photos of people inside of it. Uh, it, like other social VR apps, essentially just allows people to enter virtual rooms, be creative with virtual toys, um, play games, and kind of just do anything that you could do in the actual world socially, but in VR, as fun, cute cartoon avatars. Okay, so that all sounds really great and lovely and shiny and wonderful, but there's a downside because we live in the world and there's always a downside, and the downside I'm gonna talk about today is harassment, uh, which is a burgeoning problem in a lot of social VR. So because that might sound weird if you're not familiar with VR or social VR or anything in that world, I'm gonna start with a little role play. Uh, so just picture this, especially if you've never actually been into VR. So. You're gonna go into VR, it's a social experience. You set up an avatar, and in this case, you choose feminine characteristics because you identify as female. You choose an outfit that seems perfectly appropriate, and when you're ready, you spawn into the space. You have no idea who will be there or where you will be. You're just there. All of a sudden, a bunch of strange avatars, they see you, they notice that you're slightly different, they approach you, they maybe chase you, They kind of virtually try to touch your avatar. They maybe give you unsolicited kisses. Um, at that point in time, you're terrified. You try to block them. You realize you don't know how. And then you rip off your headset and you decide, I don't belong here. Uh, that might sound insane, but that narrative is actually based on multiple accounts of avatar harassment that were reported by women in VR over the past couple of years. Uh, that one specifically is based on tech writer Taylor Lawrence's experience that she wrote on a Mike.com article. So that's just the beginning. Uh, <laughs> Less, there's a lot. Uh, less than two years later, a social VR app called VRChat actually had to publicly vow to make safety a top priority after a female game designer uh, shared an incredibly graphic video of sexual harassment occurring in one of their chat rooms. Uh, after that, in 2018, Jessica Outlaw, a VR researcher, published a study reporting that essentially half of women who are taking part in social VR have experienced some form of sexual harassment. So, knowing that, Andrea and I, that coworker I mentioned earlier that was in the video, uh, we decided to join forces uh, on our own time and write an extensive paper detailing all of the dangers of harassment in VR and kind of instructing users on how, or creators on how to use body sovereignty and the ideology of sexual consent to kind of bake respect and safety into their virtual spaces. So right now the abstract of this is on Facebook research and it'll be published soon in a book on um, design ethics that is listed right here and I can talk about it later if you're interested. Okay, so on to the next thing. We're just going through this real fast. Um, 
Uh, okay, so why did we feel like we had to do this? Because it's kind of an abstract problem. Uh, and it's because when you're in VR, interactions can feel extremely real. And this sensation of perceiving your avatar as your actual self is called virtual embodiment. Um, that just broadly describes the experience in which anyone perceives their virtual body as their actual body. Um, so to kind of talk about what this means psychologically, who here has heard of the rubber hand illusion? Okay, all right, cool, good, good amount, about the same as last time. Um, to go really fast through it, it's pretty much, uh, it's a study where someone puts a rubber hand in front of you in a place that is plausibly your own hand, they hide your own hand, then they do things to that hand, uh, eventually escalating to threatening that hand, usually with a knife, and then you start to perceive what happens to that hand as happening to you. Uh, this experiment has been repeated recently in VR, and it works. So when people threaten virtual bodies, people can internalize that fear as real. And this is particularly worrisome because harassment on the internet, not new, definitely a thing, definitely was a thing, definitely still a thing. Um, and the physicality of VR gives harassers terrifying new ways to attack people. It's just like amplified trolls. We don't need that. So that's where the inspiration for virtual respect comes from. Uh, the idea that despite any of those factors, every single person deserves to be able to feel safe uh, and like autonomous and empowered inside of VR. And I think this part is worth talking about and it's that this concept probably felt more obvious to us as opposed to other members of our team because as women, we think a lot more about safety in real life. Uh, if you don't believe me, here's some stills from this uh, Jackson Katz experiment in which he asks men and women what they do on a daily basis to avoid being sexually assaulted. And for women, the list begins with, hold my keys as a potential weapon, check the back seat before getting in the car, always carry a cell phone, be careful not to drink too much, never put my drink down and come back to it. Make sure I never see my drink being poured. <laughs> Gary Mace, have an unlisted number, etc. I mean, you get it. That's like a quarter of the list, by the way. Uh, the standard male answer was nothing. I don't think about it. Uh, so we knew it was important to look at the problem of virtual reality harassment from our unique perspective as women in VR. So we started looking with uh, looking at consent language, uh, starting with kind of standard definitions of consent. And while writing this paper that we wrote in the year of Me Too, we had a lot of inspiration to work from, so that was convenient and terrible. Um, so anyway, with that, with looking at consent, we took that and then we grew that into a practice of looking at body sovereignty as an interactive principle that could be used to ensure uh, interactive, sorry, that could be used to ensure safe and inclusive spaces. And um, we began to think about that as building virtual respect, which, as I've kind of suggested earlier, is a state of being where everyone has the autonomy and the comfort to be their fullest self. Okay, so now that that's, that's all well and good, you know, high level, awesome things, etc. But how do we actually do that? How do we bake consent into the fabric of the virtual world? Well, our theory was that we could build tools that would empower people and that we could specifically build those tools by looking at consent acquisition paradigms in the real world and then developing or proposing uh, interactive equivalents to all of those. So to do this, we were gonna need a philosophy um, for creating codes of conduct in general. We looked at the work of Edward T. Hall, who is an awesome social psychologist and researcher, and he explored how people behave in real world spaces, and he divides those spaces into different proximities from like the physical body. Uh, and this is what that looks like. This is like Edward T. Hall's zones of interpersonal space. Each zone in the real world has like an established code of conduct for how we might behave and the things that we expect to happen to us in those spaces. Um, so I'm going to do what we kind of do in our article, which is walk you through these individual spaces and kind of talk about just one instance of an example for each space of how you can actually look at uh, that space and then suggest a new kind of interactive principle for that. So first we'll start with intimate space and a real world example could be a bedroom. 
Um, and for those spaces, we suggest that creators look at building granular controls that are surfaced before intimate interactions begin. So to look at that, what we thought of was we actually took inspiration from yes, no, maybe charts in the real world, which are kind of a salacious thing to mention, but it's a, sort of an intimate agreement that a couple might have where they would grab pieces of paper, write out every intimate act that they could consider imaginable, and then kind of rank them all between things they would do, things they would never do, things they might consider doing just to set the tone for things to come so that nothing, you know, unconsensual ever comes up. And uh, so we look at that and we think about that in VR as surface granular controls, surface them before things happen, and allow people to define their ideal experiences up front. And our example here that we're looking at is from Rec Room, which is a social VR app. Uh, definitely a fun favorite, I'm a big fan. Um, and it shows granular controls for interactions that are in the settings panel. And this dialog specifically um, shows controls for the safety bubble, which allows users to control how, specifically how close other users can get to them. And it allows them to do this before they might come in contact with users, so before anything dangerous happens. Okay, there's one. Next, personal space. Uh, in the real world, this is like a shared household space, like a living room, and to build safety in personal spaces, uh, in virtual personal spaces, we looked at how medical practices negotiate consent through nonverbal cues. Um, so specifically, we looked at how the National Institute of Health um, will actually assure ongoing consent through deaf participants through universal gestures. And we suggest that designers of virtual spaces can use safety gestures and specifically universal gestures uh, and then surface those to users who might have become inactive or have failed to report an incident in some way. So these gestures allow users to be able to quickly jump out of any experience at the drop of a hat or flag something uh, in context without having to go through dialogues. It's, it's like an urgent dropout. Okay, continuing on. Thank you for dealing with this high speed, by the way. Okay. Next up, social space. So in the real world, we use the example a lot of a college, I'm getting a call, okay, gone. We use the example of a college campus for this one. And to make social virtual spaces safer, um, we specifically look at unspoken location-based conduct codes or agreements. Um, and we looked a lot at rules created by colleges to prevent on-campus assault specifically. Uh, we actually looked a lot at Antioch College. Um, so in VR, how we can translate that uh, is that we should build rules into the fabric of a social VR space and then customize them to the exact need of like what goes on in the specific community in that space. Uh, and the example we're looking at is actually from Facebook Spaces. And it is, it's something that is greeted, that greets people who are entering a room that was generated by a group. Uh, so these are people who already have an existing kind of like premise and reason for being together, and this just reminds them to keep things kind of within the bounds of whatever group type that was. Okay, finally, last one, public spaces. Uh, in the real world, uh, we like to use the public space examples of a park, or even an entire city, essentially anywhere where you could meet any kind of person. Uh, and to in ensure inclusivity in virtual public spaces, we are actually trying to push people to think about like universal law systems. Um, we suggest looking at real world law systems as inspiration. So specifically the real world's definition of consent of behavior violations and approaches to criminal consequences. Um, I'll kind of skip through it, but we're just sort of showing some of the women here who um, were supporting the Me Too Act in Congress. But what I'll really jump into is this VR chat example, which is VR chat, that app that I mentioned earlier that got flagged via that, um, that graphic video that was posted by a female game designer, has done a lot of really good work in creating their universal trust and safety system that sets a tone and expectation for all behavior across all worlds in their universe, and also allows, it has made reporting a lot easier, which allows them to like punish bad actors much more quickly. 
So as a recap, these are the suggestions for all the spaces. If you need a photo, now is the time. <laughs> Go for it. But the general push here is that we can evaluate virtual behavior um, through our real world sense of place and that we can actually really easily design the future for using our understanding of existing kind of social experiences. Okay. Sorry, I was watching him change the clock. I was like, oh no, things are happening. Time is different now. Um, but yeah, anyway, the end thought is just we can always you like use the past and use existing paradigms in the real world and in things that we understand to design things that we don't understand like we don't understand the implications of social vr nobody does but we do understand the implications of social behavior in general and we can use that and if any of you are vr creators or any of you plan to be vr creators i leave you with the statement of a safe future is in our virtual hands and your virtual hands so make it good make it better and that's it thank you